Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Alex Berry. Um, I work for a company called Sutru and uh, we've been working for the last 10 years on a device that does automated suturing, so medical stitches. Uh, the reason that uh, it's applicable to multi-material prototyping is that we have prototyped our device entirely uh, using 3D printing uh, in five or six different forms uh, and laser etching. So one of the points that we're trying to make here is that there is um, an argument to be made that prototyping in medical devices now uh, can go all the way to clinical trials using additive manufacturing as a prototyping process. So hopefully this will play. We're gonna hmm, maybe. <laughs> so uh, the device that we've been working on uh, does automate automated stitches. It, there we go. Um, press a button, and you have a needle rotating within a an enclosed device. Uh, we have various different sizes of this, but it's the first device that can do this with any size of needle and any type of needle. Uh, we have been um, trialing this for about three years now uh, on various different tissue types, and you'll see that we actually have different sizes as well. So this is the smaller version. Uh, the larger version is for external wound closure, and this is more for internal anastomosis and more delicate work. Um, recently, we've been working on the endoscopic and robotic device. Um, we've actually been out to trial to, to make sure that the forces that are generated by the needle are equal to or exceed the amount of force that's generated by hand. So the device itself is proven to be equal to or superior to certain aspects of suturing by hand. This is the first device that we made eight years ago. So eight years ago, this was machined, this was milled by a company. Um, it took six months. It cost uh, one and a half thousand pounds, about the same in euros. And it didn't work, it was, it, the design was flawed. There was no way it was going to work. It was 17 prototypes ago. But it took six months and it took 1,500 pounds. Now we recently re printed this on our own Form Labs printer, and it took three hours and three pounds. So the argument for additive manufacturing and prototyping is quite strong when you see the difference in both time and cost. We've moved, <laughs> that's quite dark. Um, so we've moved now to um, fully enclosed devices. This is our larger version. And you can see from front to back uh, the entire device is printed. Uh, we've used SLS, SLM, SLA, um, some fused deposition uh, printing as well. But apart from one particular element in the device, the entire thing has been printed um, through all of our prototyping process. This is our larger version. Uh, this is uh, the smaller version. Fortunately, these pictures are quite dark. Um, and so our ultimate challenge uh, was to move on to being able to suture endoscopically or robotically. How do you play the video? How did you play it? Oh, okay. So one of the things that we've learned in showing this uh, video is you then change it to black and white so people aren't sick. Because uh, in color, people tend to be quite ill. But this is an example of uh, completing one suture robotically. Um, the current technique that's used um, with the most popular uh, robot, the Da Vinci. So this takes 25 seconds approximately to do a complete suture, one single stitch. Our recent device, uh, this is just the test bed to show um, the speed that we can complete a suture. Again. You can see the speed of being able to do a single suture. It's just a simple rotation. Uh, we have had this going up to three times per second. 
So a simple mechanism to replace uh, what is currently done by Forset, uh, where you have to uh, you have to push the needle through the tissue, release it, and then retake it to complete the suture. One si simple mechanism allows it to be completed. The reason I showed this video is from left to right, there's several different methods of, uh, uh, of manufacturing there. We have, again, SLS, laser etched, SLS, SLM. The internal components are metal printed. Um, and the last part is an SLA part. So it's a, it's a range of different materials that we've used to be able to complete a working model. And to give you an impression, the tip of that uh, device is the end of my finger, uh, my little finger. The whole end of that is uh, 22 millimeters with 32 internal components. Uh, so we moved on to be able to do a, a, an endoscopic version of this, um, completed with all of the controls that are necessary. Um, you can see at the far end is the tip that you've just seen functioning. Um, the trials are ongoing at the moment, um, but the completion of that entire, uh, the, the handle and the arm that's uh, in use for trials, again, cost-wise, it was, in, in your terms, about 400 euros, um, which allows us to have had seven different versions of this prototype, because when you see costs that are that low and return times of maybe a week in some cases to be able to complete your entire prototype, um, you can play. You can start playing with uh, different parts of your device and um, you can adjust handles. You can see what the best grip might be. Uh, and again, this is the very tip of it. So this is the end of the uh, endoscopic device. Um, again, uh, the needle that travels uh, in the channel in the middle there is a 22 millimeter needle. Uh, so it is very small. The whole device fits down a 12 millimeter trocar. Um, and again, there's in, in there we now have uh, some brass components. So although um, 3D printing is very important in prototyping, sometimes if you need a cable or you need a screw or a bolt, you don't have to print it. You can buy them, they're, they're a lot cheaper and it's a lot quicker. Um, what we found is just combining uh, different methods of manufacturing uh, can, can, can get you a fully working model for as far as medical prototyping, uh, medical clinical trials. Uh, this is the smaller version of our handheld and you can see the, the rollers, um, so the four sets of rollers at the top there are the mechanism that actually turns the needle. So um, underneath those rollers, you can see a metal plate, and that is what our intellectual property is all about. It's a lateral spring plate, and that's what creates grip on the needle. Um, that is the only part in what you can see there that is not printed. It's laser etched. Uh, but again, if you can work your tolerances when you do your design, you can combine laser etched and printed materials in, in, uh, in various different forms and create a working model. This, this device, the top of that is the size of a penny. There you go, there's a penny. Um, and a very faded picture. Um, but it does give you an impression of the actual size. <laughs> they're so much easier when they're smaller. Um, but this, the size of the mechanism and how small you can go down to uh, something that functions and functions consistently. This isn't something where we're putting parts in and just sort of hoping that they will work. Uh, these are uh, consistent models that we've had needles rotating uh, in this mechanism at 3,000 revolutions per minute. So you don't, do, you don't need that when you're doing a, a surgical process, but at least it's proof that the, the mechanism internally functions properly. And those are the, the, that's the, the breakup of the components that we have. Um, again, you can see different printed parts. Originally, um, before we found a, uh, a metal printer that could function properly, you can see uh, that there are brass gears in there. Um, and they were commercially sourced, and that's wonderful. Uh, it doesn't cost you much money. But unfortunately, brass gears um, aren't very strong. They're inherently weak. 
And if you have anything that happens with the mechanism, what tends to happen is one of the teeth from the gear breaks off. And then you have to take the whole thing apart and found, find the tooth, find the gear that's broken and start again. We went through hundreds of brass gears. Um, about four years ago, before we found a printer, which is a, a concept laser printer, uh, that was capable of creating gears uh, with uh, great enough accuracy. Oh, I'll go past you. So this is the, uh, the, the entire mechanism internally for, uh, for rotating a needle. Um, so we have the rollers on the top, the spring plate and the gears. Um, this is effectively everything that you need within a casing um, to be able to um, have a functional device. These are um, all printed. Um, cost is minimal. Um, time is minimal. We normally get a return on these parts within four or five days. And what it allows you to do is to play. It allows you to try different parts. We went through 800 different versions of rollers. Um, so 800 different shapes and ways to grip a needle and uh, and materials, and they cost in total uh, less than five thousand pounds to prototype. So, eight hundred different versions is impossible to do without additive manufacturing, unless you've got a very very big checkbook. And that's um, the plate that our uh, entire endoscopic version was printed on. <laughs> so this is ninety millimeters by ninety millimeters. Um, you can see the external casing and to the left and above uh, all of the gears that we have. Um, the rollers that are on there, there are uh, 15 different types of roller because you don't, the printer doesn't care what you're putting on it. So you can uh, design a variety of different shapes and sizes to, uh, to ensure functionality. Um, and uh, this plate with Concept Laser, interestingly Concept printed this and the gears that are on here, the teeth are 0.4 of a millimeter. So they're very small teeth on these gears. When Concept printed this, they came back to us and said uh, they didn't realize their machine could do this. So in some cases, the design uh, leads to uh, the development of the, the, the printing mechanisms themselves, the, the printers. Um, and Concept Laser now are partnering with us to complete all of our um, prototypes through to clinical trials because they're just interested to see what their machines can do. Um, so, quite a faded photo. Um, this gives you an idea, again, of the size of the parts. Um, this is a plate of um, 90 millimeters by 90 millimeters. There's 600 parts on this plate. And effectively, they could be 600 completely different parts. Um, if you think of uh, traditional manufacturing, where to create those parts, um, you are looking at tooling costs of maybe 10,000 pounds. If you uh, had 600 individual parts at 10,000 pounds each, that's quite a large amount of money. To print this plate, uh, the individual parts came down to about three pounds per part, approximately three euros. So 10,000 pounds, three pounds, there's quite a difference. And this gives you a sense of scale. So the markings at the bottom there are millimeters. Um, you have features on this uh, particular part. You can see the gear teeth are the 0.4 millimeter gear teeth. The striations on the right hand side there are 40 microns. So they are actually designed uh, considering the powder particle uh, in the printer. Um, and they're pretty much the smallest features that you can get before you go to extremely specialized metal 3D printers, and they function. Um, and then find, well, in terms of our endoscopic devices, it's the full printed endoscopic device before it was treated. Again, a combination of all these different parts that you have. Inside there is a motor that's contained with, uh, with batteries. We've changed the shape of this now eight different times, uh, because we can. 
Uh, you can give, try different grips, uh, different ways of holding it. Um, and that has also led to um, our robotic version of a device, which is effectively the same mechanism, but it clips into a robot. So aside from doing a suturing device, what this has led to are these pictures. So moving on from having worked for this for 10 years, uh, one of the surgeons I worked with uh, handed me this picture about three years ago and asked me if we could model this uh, for a cardiac stabilizer, an endoscopic cardiac stabilizer. Um, in design terms, that's what I got. That's the only picture I got, and it led to, sorry, the pictures are mixed up here. I'm going to have to find them. <laughs> Very mixed up. We'll go back to those. So it led to a replacement for this particular device. So this is a, a cardiac stabilizer for, an, uh, an, no, for open heart surgery. And from that drawing that you saw, it led to us prototyping this. So uh, this is um, a, an endoscopic cardiac stabilizer. Um, it has suction cups on the underside. And what this means is from that simple drawing that you saw, instead of having an operation where you open the chest and use this device to stabilize the heart, um, we have this. So this stabilizer gets inserted just under the pectoral muscle um, and allows for an endoscopic um, operation as opposed to an open heart surgery. And um, the simplest form that we can explain it is that when you're using this mechanism, where you're opening up the chest and stabilizing the heart externally, um, the patient is in hospital normally for about four days, uh, in intensive care for four days, in hospital for about two weeks. Um, they have palliative care for about two months, and they'll, they have comfort after about six months. Um, the equivalent with this device, the phrase we use is they should be walking the dog after a month. So in having a, a mechanism now to be able to create multi-material devices from simple drawings, um, we're hoping that this particular device will lead to operations that are obviously a lot more comfortable for the patient, uh, but also reduce an enormous amount of cost to the hospital. And this device in development has cost us, the equivalent that I always make is that it has cost less than a PlayStation to develop a PlayStation or a cell phone. We've spent um, an enormous amount of 300 pounds on the entire development of this device um, because in partnership with, with Concept Laser, they've made the metal parts for us. And it doesn't take any more than a, a simple design in comparison to the previous device to complete it. This was done in about a month. Um, Going to have to go back over some images here, unfortunately. So these are the equivalents that I now see we need to be working on. These are single prints. These are, um, these are mechanisms that have been using one particular material, uh, sorry, devices, or um, this is a, a, a Voronoi cast that's been developed. We've actually met the company that have done this. But what we've come to find is a, a lot of the things that are used in medicine at the moment are concentrating on one material or one manufacturing method. Um, we haven't found anybody that is looking at device development and mixing materials. Um, you can see a, a range. This is, um, this is a, a patient, a cancer patient who has uh, this has been inserted as an artificial rib cage and a sternum. And you can see that it's, it has been printed. It's a, it's a wonderful um, print, um, and the patient is obviously very comfortable. But everything that we find is in a single material. Um, we have materials in titanium um, where the porosity of the material encourages bone growth. Um, but again, all of the development that's being done at the moment that we've found 
is single material. It's titanium or steel or, um, uh, or filament plastics. There are some rare uh, examples where there have been combinations of materials, but the, the tooth side of this um, has been developed uh, using traditional casting, and then the underside has been printed in, um, in titanium, I believe. There's only one um, hip joint that we found where they're actually using nylons um, with titanium, um, and I, I believe those are brass screws. But there's, there aren't very many um, devices at the moment that are being developed using the greatest extent of 3D printing that you can. Um, 3D printing and traditional manufacturing. Um, and what we're trying to encourage is when you look back at the um, stabilizer, this stabilizer has um, its metal on top, and then this one is uh, the MED 610 um, material because it's, it's um, regulated for 24-hour use. This is using multiple materials in a device that should be used medically. Um, and it seems to be very rare that people are, are concentrating on the one machine they have or the one method that they have in doing uh, device development. And our encouragement is to say, we think people should be trying to, to mix and match. I'm not sure which order these videos are in. There are examples of uh, uh, these great images that you have of, these are single prints that the, the printer is being able to mix uh, different materials and colors during the print. But this is still one printer. This looks like it's multiple materials in, in use in, in, uh, in its print, but it's a single print. What we are looking at are, this is an example that we had for, um, this went on to CNN. Uh, it's a full-size spine. And we've used two different materials and an internal structure to create something which it's only a spine, it's only a, a, an example. Um, but it, it's one of the small examples of where you can use multiple materials to create something that effectively works. This articulates as well. Um, yeah, so um, the mix of the images at the moment, unfortunately, is throwing me off a little bit. Um, <laughs> it is, but it's in a funny order, unfortunately. Um, I have to excuse myself. Yeah, so this is the, the in our terms with the, um, the endoscopic device, uh, this is the culmination of what we've completed. So this is now, if the video plays, the robotic version in its first trial. So again, if you imagine that that is uh, 12 millimeters, um, the device uh, travels down a 12 millimeter trocar. Um, it rotates into position. Um, all the mechanisms for this are, are printed. Um, oh, that, yeah. It articulates. This is on a um, captain motion uh, robot, so this is all controlled robotically. I can actually do um, it. And then we have needle rotation as well. So the development of a device that can complete that at that scale, uh, with gears that are so small, um, it's currently uh, being trialed at the Royal Brompton. Um, this is the level that you can scale down to with a working mechanism. Um, the I, I apologize for the mix of the, uh, the, the images, um, but this is the combination of what we have. I do actually have this, the end of that device I have with me, uh, if anyone wants to see the internal mechanism as well. Um, all the gears, there's, uh, inside that end part, there are 32 components, um, so you can imagine the size of them. But uh, I actually have it with me, so you'll be able to see how small these gears really are. Um, and I think with my mix of images, I will um, end it there. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>